Yeah, thank you very much, Patricia, for the introductions. Um, so I guess, you know, having to do this in a sort of an unplugged way, just prompting myself on my own slides, um, maybe it's more a matter of trying to persuade you around the, the, the question that we set ourselves in the, the title of this talk, which is Net Zero Agriculture by 2040, Can We Do It? So it's my job is to try and persuade you that that is indeed possible and that we're not just, uh, you know, uh, putting out a lot of empty words. If uh, you know, any of you saw Greta Thunberg, uh, the video uh, taken uh, at, the, at the Youth Summit <coughs> in Milan, being really rather, well, very, in, in very simple terms, rather excoriating about all of the declarations by world politicians, um, you know, setting very impressive sounding goals, uh, talking about their ambitions and targets and so on, but ultimately it's blah, 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 if it isn't actually matched by action. So to some extent, uh, demonstrating that the NFU really means what it says when we say, yeah, we think that our industry can make a contribution towards the national goal of net zero by 2050. We think our industry really should have its ducks in a row 10 years earlier than that. Um, and, and you know, there were certain reasons for saying, let's not set a target that's too far off into the future. Um, if we can do it, we ought to be able to do it within 20 years. 10 years is to sort of do the easy stuff, and then the 10 years that follows that is perhaps to do the things that have yet to be, well, not, not quite, you know, we're not gonna fall into that John Kerry trap of talking about things that have yet to be invented, but things that are still under development and which are not yet ready to deploy but we do believe, perhaps the other side of 2030, it will also make a significant contribution towards this overall counterbalancing. So the problem that agriculture has is that we all like to eat. I've just had uh, a steak and Stilton pie in the pub. Um, that's a big source of greenhouse gas emissions. I could have gone for the vegan alternative, but um, you know, Realistically, our food is so important in terms of our lifestyle and what we think is, you know, having a, having a pleasant choice of things to eat. We've come quite a long way from living off subsistence agriculture and having to be forced to eat seasonally and so on. And we have a fantastic choice of foods. We don't really want to give that up. We're prepared to fly with alternative technologies and drive with different technologies and uh, God help us hopefully heat our homes with much better technologies and try and keep more heat in the home in the first place. Um, but perhaps changing our diets dramatically is the last thing that most people want to do. But uh, you know, in the agriculture sector, what is rather unique is that we have the capacity to be a sink for greenhouse gas emissions or to contribute to sinks for greenhouse gas emissions, as well as being a source of greenhouse gas emissions. And so, as an industry, our plan is based around trying to minimize what we produce by being more efficient, and then um, creating ways in which we can be actively removing greenhouse gas emissions from the atmosphere to counterbalance those residual and unavoidable emissions. We're not the only sector of the economy which is in that position. Now, some people say, well, you know, things like aviation has got a similar problem. It's certainly relatively difficult to decarbonize. Um, somewhere in the economy as a whole, and when we talk about the national strategy to get the whole economy down to net zero, or even the global strategy, there will be activities that humans do that are really difficult or just not at all cost effective to try and make zero in terms of emissions at the point of source as a result of that economic activity. So having um, ways in which you can counterbalance by removing greenhouse gas emissions from the atmosphere is really rather important. Unfortunately, we think there are two ways of doing that, and I'll say a little bit more about it in a, in a moment. But just to talk about sort of recent progress in agriculture, well, I, I come from a, a, a university academic background and, and also some work as a government scientist actually in, in the United States rather than here, but a certain amount of work with the UK government previously. But I found a home in uh, the agricultural sector, advising the agricultural sector, um, because the agricultural sector firstly believes that it is really rather exposed to climate change as a, as a, you know, a, a productive part of the economy. Things that farmers do are, many of them, out of doors and they are very much susceptible to changing seasons and so on. Now, you know, first of all, they're driven by an annual cycle, but one year is not necessarily like another year. And so uh, you, know, you can't just say, oh yes, we're gonna get progressively better every year 
and, and measure it, no. You know, ag if you want to try and measure what agriculture is doing, you probably have to be looking at a sort of a five-year rolling average, whether you're looking at wheat yields or carbon footprints. So, um, when I joined the NFU about 15 years ago, um, what we were all excited about then were transport biofuels. The idea that some of our petrol and diesel needs, and oh yes, you know, petrol and diesel are kind of important, aren't they? Um, could be replaced by um, non-petroleum alternatives. We could blend ethanol into <coughs> gasoline, petrol. We could um, put vegetable oils or processed vegetable oils in as an alternative to diesel. And those are indeed, or still in the public fuel supply, blended at about the you know, sort of five to ten percent level. Um, what we haven't done is to go all the way to replacing our transport fuels with stuff that we would grow on the land. Probably, with hindsight, a good thing, because we want to be able to use our land for all sorts of other decarbonisation purposes, and uh, decarbonising our transport fuels without really changing anything else is perhaps not necessarily the optimal path to go down. But that's what we were very excited about, growing oilseed rape and growing wheat and turning wheat into ethanol and oilseed rape into vegetable oil and then ultimately biodiesel. But we've come a long way since then. So in uh, starting probably about 10 years ago was when we started to see quite significant uptake in the agricultural sector of small-scale renewable energy technology. So farmers have started to put up wind turbines uh, supported by a, a government support scheme to encourage investment in renewables. Um, and certainly solar took off in a big way. So very many farms have solar on their roofs. Um, and you know, we're seeing um, you know, a resurgence of development in really quite large ground-mounted uh, solar fields, solar farms, solar parks, call them what you will. Um, because uh, you know, the technology is becoming cheap as chips. It is really extremely competitive. There's some extraordinary things which I'll, I'll say perhaps a little bit more about in a, in, in a minute in terms of the massive scale at which the solar industry is likely to grow in the future. So we've developed a bit of a paradigm in the UK of can we actually have solar fields or solar rooftops and make them look at least reasonably attractive or at least integrate them into what farms look like. And you know, um, Jeremy here is an example. You know, we want... Um, the, the modern farm, the future, should probably be making use of its roof space for capturing solar energy. Because the buildings are there and because they're owned by the farmer, it, it it's, uh, you know, really stands to reason, it's common sense. Um, so there are you know, many things which we think are going to be changing in the agricultural landscape and have already changed over the time that I've been working at the NFU in terms of uh, you know, th th this approach to modernization of farming, continuing to produce food, but being able to produce other public benefit non-food services as well. And most recently, um, one of the most interesting developments perhaps has been the rise of electric cars. You know, they were a bit of a joke 10 years ago. Along came Elon Musk and Tesla and started saying, no, 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 you can make these things to be aspirational and high performance. And now everybody in the car industry is pretty much copying Tesla and government policies are coming in saying, no, 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 we're going to be phasing out petrol and diesel vehicle sales. And rather interestingly, and I wonder why, there's been this huge uptick of interest in new and second-hand electric cars just in the last week or so. <laughs> and really, seriously, this is being reported from the, the, the showrooms and so on. And sales are actually genuinely growing, and the government, yes, has set a target to try and phase out petrol and diesel new vehicle sales. There's, there'll be a legacy of fossil fuel fueled vehicles, or at least vehicles that are running on these 90% fossil fuel, 10% renewable energy blends for a while, but the future of quite a lot of motive services for transport uh, is likely to be electric. And that's interesting for agriculture because we're probably going to be the last sector to have agricultural machinery available to us, but it's starting to become available already. We're starting to see prototype electric tractors, we're already seeing commercially available um, other agricultural machinery. There's a, a picture of one which I'm sure, sorry, I can't show it to you, but made by JCB. It's called a telehandler. It's like a great big forklift truck used for stacking big crates of potatoes and onions and things like that in, in, in sheds for vegetable producers, but multiple other purposes. It's a general farm run around vehicle, and you can have an electric one now if you want to pay a little bit for it. So, who are we? National Farmers Union, we're the largest agricultural trade body. In the country, um, we're often regarded as the voice of agriculture. We're not the only voice of agriculture, but we are perhaps the most significant voice. And 
you know, people like the president of the NFU can become media stars in their own right. You've seen it with Lynette Batters, um, who I think you know, many people think is, is very presentable and very articulate on the telly, and so she's become much in demand. But you know, she's not the only uh, uh, public figure as the president of the NFU. We've had Peter Kendall, Sir Peter Kendall these days, uh, in the past, who was quite well known um, about 10 years ago. Go back a bit before that, there was a chap called Ben Gill who helped steer agriculture through the last really bad bout of foot and mouth disease. So it's a relatively high profile um, organisation to work for. Some people say that we're sort of DEFRA in hiding. So DEFRA is the agricultural body that, or civil servants that makes agricultural policy, but they change and their ministers rotate and their staff rotate and so on. And some people would say the NFU actually has got better corporate memory and understanding of the industry than DEFRA themselves. So, you know, no, we, we don't want to be quite so arrogant as to say we write agricultural policy and DEFRA just adopts it. But we are quite a significant body, I think, um, both in terms of the policy, um, you know, the politics of how we use land in this country and how we produce food and do other non-food activities on the land. Um, but increasingly, actually, it is those non-food services coming from the farm um, which are becoming more and more important. The other services that farmers can provide, non-food feedstocks, which farmers have always produced. We don't only produce food, they grow stuff for fibre. We've had sheep's wool and we, we grow all sorts of fibre crops. Um, and you know, things like the transport biofuels industry, processing agricultural produce into other commodities is, is another uh, you know, example of that sort of thing. And then there's the whole sort of nature and biodiversity services which farmers are also, to some extent, uh, helping to deliver. You know, wildlife trusts and RSPB and people like that may set the scene, but farmers are often the people who are actually on the ground managing the hedgerows or following defer instructions on uh, how to you know, have a pond on the farm or a bit of woodland or something of the sort and provide some of this public amenity stuff that people like when they go out into the countryside. So, um, uh, I've already said, yes, you know, we, given the impact of climate change on our sector, um, we've acknowledged that we have a big role now in both understanding how climate change is going to impact on farming, but also what farming can do to try and help the nation tackle climate change. And yes, we're a source and a sink of greenhouse gas emissions. And we farm about 75% three quarters of national land area. Um, it's a relatively high proportion in this country. We're not like France or Germany or um, you know, some other large European member states where 25 or 35% of the national area is actually forest and woodland. Uh, forest and woodland in this country is relatively small um, proportion of the total, it's about 3 million hectares, about 12%. Um, agricultural activities of one kind or another tend to dominate. It's mostly grazing, grassland, uh, pasture, whether it's upland or lowland. Um, and then a smaller proportion of land, but dominant in some areas, are what most people think of as farming, which is, you know, any of you watch Jeremy Clarkson's program and he's sitting on his tractor going, oh, look, I'm farming, I'm farming. But he's driving a tractor up and down, cultivating the ground which is what many people think farming looks like. So animal farming, growing crops in rotation, uh, that's about four and a half million hectares. So it's a, a smaller part of the total, which is about 18, what, 17 to 18 million hectares. Uh, but anyway, agriculture is pretty dominant in Britain. So you know, we have this significant profile. Um, now, moving on to the subject of the talk today, back 2019, just about the time, in fact, we got it in just before um, the national commitment was made. We could see the writing on the wall. We knew from previous government policy advice and so on that we begin with the Royal Committee on Environmental Pollution. There was a goal to cut greenhouse gas emissions in the UK by 60%. Then there was a new target to cut by 80%, which really came in with the Climate Change Act of 2008, um, which is when you know, David Cameron was in opposition. And there was you know, a considerable amount of political consensus that this was already quite an important issue, that we were going to have to cut greenhouse gas emissions and Britain really ought to be leading on it. Um, but then in 2019, um, you know, we could see the writing on the wall coming. Uh, the Independent Climate Change Committee that was set up back in 2008 
um, was in the process of revising its advice to government to see should the government set a net zero target, which means 100% cut on balance in greenhouse gas emissions. So removing as much from the atmosphere on balance as you are putting out into the atmosphere from all of your economic activities. And that, came, that advice came out in about May 2019. Um, at the beginning of 2019, we surprised everybody to some extent by saying, you know what, agriculture is going to have a big role in this. And so we must set our own net zero goal, uh, net zero across all agricultural activities, which means those greenhouse gas withdrawals as well as the production activities, um, by 2014. And we're now two years into that plan. And so the question is, you know, how much progress do we think we're making now? Have we set up the right structures to help us deliver the plan? Have we got people like Patricia on board? Yes, we do, uh, helping to advise us and say, you know, stick within the science. We hear that from Greta Thunberg as well. Listen to the scientists. If it's not science-based, then it's not actually very credible. It could all just be smoke and mirrors or completely wrong ideas. Um, so, uh, where are we? You know, we're, we're, the starting point, to some extent, bearing in mind what I was saying earlier about farmers starting to move, move into renewable energy production, is that, um, yes, uh, farmers already make a substantial contribution to low carbon energy services, perhaps servicing other parts of the economy rather than necessarily servicing agriculture itself, because of having all that land and often therefore being um, at least the landlord for things like large um, wind farms on land and large solar farms and also um, the you know certainly the operation if not the ownership of things like anaerobic digesters biogas plants that that uh, you know essentially break down organic matter <coughs> and produce methane gas which then either goes into the gas grid or is burned on site in a generator engine to produce continuous electric power. And then there are other activities as well that farmers contribute to. Um, notably, I think we could talk about things like straw fired power plants. So the UK produces something of a structural surplus of agricultural straw from all that arable activity. Some of it is required for livestock bedding and other purposes like that. Some of it is, as people would argue, on certain soils is better ploughed back into the soil as a soil uh, amendment. But there is a surplus, a tradable surplus, and uh, you know, about a million tonnes of UK straw at the moment goes in as a fuel to straw-fired power stations, which are just like smallish versions of big thermal power stations, about 40 foot to 50 megawatts each one. There's one in Sleaford, there's one in Snetterton, um, there's one in uh, Brig near Scunthorpe. Um, and you know, those things are just pro providing continuous electric power using a fuel, which just happens to be something that farmers can very easily supply as a byproduct of regular food production. What's not to like about that? So there were already quite a number of activities that farmers were engaged in and continue to be engaged in, which helped to contribute towards this overall goal then, of decarbonising the economy. Um, the other thing that we do need to respect to some extent, though, is uh, yes, you know, um, We've got twin crises here. There is, you know, if you listen to the protesters on the streets, there is a biodiversity crisis at the same time as a climate crisis. And so it is important that perhaps in addressing the climate crisis, we don't do things which are going to be really bad in terms of managing biodiversity as well. Moving on. So what's coming up? Well, yeah, COP26 uh, in Glasgow, uh, coming up starting at the, uh, the very end of October on Halloween night, um, and uh, uh, you know, going off two weeks after that, um, you know, you've seen the Prime Minister over in New York at New York Climate Week making, making speeches, clearly there's going to be a lot more of that as he hosts uh, alongside Alex Sharma, who is technically the president of COP26, uh, the former um, uh, Bayes Minister um, for, responsible for energy and industry. Um, and uh, yeah, alongside all the political pontif pontification and so on, it is really critical that um, you know, different countries come forward with uh, more ambitious goals for cutting emissions and uh, you know, other important things, uh, including that American declaration that came in New York Climate Week, that uh, more money is going to be made available to help other poorer nations manage the transition uh, through climate change, uh, becoming low carbon economies themselves. Um, but also, uh, you know, dealing with some of the consequences of climate change. All very important if this is really going to be a global goal. And remember, it wasn't really a global goal until that 
Paris climate talks in 2015. The Paris Agreement was very significant because that was the point at which finally all world leaders said, yeah, I think we can all sign up to a common goal here. We're not going to say, all right, those are the people who emitted all the greenhouse gases, they've got to cut them, but the rest of us are just going to carry on building our economies and we're not going to be part of the agreement. No. Now, everybody realises this is a genuine global threat, it's probably the most important threat the planet has ever faced, humanity has ever faced. We've, we've had one particular threat, we finally found out what a virus pandemic looks like after predicting it for many years. If we can mobilise resources to deal with the virus pandemic globally, haven't done a terribly good job of it, have we? But maybe this country has been, you know, we're all right, Jack, we're mostly vaccinated. We, we can't afford to do the same thing with climate change. Firstly, yes, the UK needs to set its own goal and put its own house in order and say we're going to demonstrate leadership here. But ultimately, the aim has got to be global. It's got to be, can we still keep this idea of one and a half degrees within reach? So remember, going back to some of these previous um, ambitions, people were talking about 60% cut in greenhouse gas emissions, then they were talking about 80% cut in greenhouse gas emissions, then we were talking about 100% cut in greenhouse gas emissions. At one point, everybody was saying, the aim should be to have global warming of no more than two degrees Celsius on average across the whole world. And of course, you know, different parts of the world get to warm at different rates and be impacted to a greater or lesser extent. But then in 2018, a very important uh, group of international scientists, the Government of Panel on Climate Change, came out with a recommendation to say that the impacts of one and a half degree warming are so much lesser than two degrees warming, that should really be the goal. And so the question now is, can we keep that one and a half degree warming goal within reach? We're not going to be able to solve it entirely in Glasgow. Um, you know, it's not really expectations too high, but it's going to be very important that perhaps at the end of the Glasgow talks, um, world leaders are able to say with an honest face, yes, we have made sufficient progress that that one and a half degree uh, goal is still within reach. So that's what it's all about. And uh, you know, for agriculture, you know, we're a little disappointed we haven't really had a big enough voice in. in in, in the run-up to COP26, um, agriculture did actually feature quite highly in the Paris climate talks. In the Paris Declaration, there were a number of very important qualifying statements that said that keeping um, you know, climate warming within um, tolerable limits should not be at the expense of feeding the world, maintaining um, food security and so on. So just come back to that point I was making at the beginning. Feeding people making sure that food distribution as well as just food production is adequate for the global population, managing and forecasting how big the global population is going to be and, you know, and help us, I think it's probably going to top off at about nine and a half billion and stay there, fortunately, rather than just going inexorably up and up and up and up until finally we really, really couldn't feed everybody. Um, so, Yes, but you know, all of those people want middle class lifestyles and choices of foods and so demand for things like meat and dairy products. Even if in this country people are starting to move more towards vegetarianism and veganism and plant-based products and substitutes for meat-based products and so on, much of the rest of the world is heading in a different direction. So food production and feeding the world <coughs> probably is a little bit of an exception in terms of the global goal in terms of uh, you know, how we develop our production and activities everywhere else. So uh, let's see where it goes, but clearly some parts of the world which are experiencing real extremes of weather, extreme floods that wipe things out, droughts that wipe things out and so on, um, that just maintaining enough food production is a bit of a struggle. So it's important stuff and, and agriculture here and globally clearly has a big role to play. So our net zero strategy is based, now this becomes a little bit more conceptual and difficult to describe, but look, we produced a booklet that explains it all. And uh, you know, I've, I've only got one copy of this. Um, if, if you're really interested, come over and talk to me about this afterwards or pop up some questions. But we know how much greenhouse gas emissions comes from UK agriculture. Our sector is really rather different from many other parts of the economy, if you're manufacturing widgets or cars or iPads or something of the sort, you mostly produce carbon dioxide because you burn fossil fuels like oil, coal and gas as part of the process heat or the electricity generation required to drive your process and even the extraction of the raw materials to make the iPad also produces 
carbon dioxide principally as a greenhouse gas. So that's the biggest greenhouse gas emit, uh, you know, source of emissions worldwide. Agriculture is rather different in that we use a bit of energy, so about 10% of our total greenhouse gas profile is carbon dioxide emission from direct energy use. But actually, quite a lot of it is other stuff that is a consequence of rather complex biological processes taking place in um, animals' guts and within the soil. So nitrous oxide is emitted by denitrifying bacteria in the soil as a consequence of having nitrogen available in the soil. Unfortunately, you have to have nitrogen available in the soil in order to grow crops, whether it's actually to grow pasture for the livestock to eat, or whether it is to grow your vegetables or cereals. Um, so it's kind of difficult to get away from that, unless you're going to somehow farm like you were on Mars or the space station and decouple your crop production from the atmosphere altogether, then nitrous oxide is going to end up in the atmosphere as a consequence of farming. Whether it's organic nitrogen or inorganic nitrogen that you're using to drive the crops. And some people say that even organic systems are at a disadvantage here because they, they're potentially inherently more leaky in terms of having the nitrogen sort of available all year round, whereas with manufactured fertilizers or at least applied fertilizers that maybe things like organic digestates and so on, or composts, you can try to apply them according to crop need. So you can minimize nitrous oxide production, but you'll never get rid of it altogether. Same thing with ruminant livestock producing methane. We don't yet have a methane-free ruminant animal. It's a, a complex process of breaking down the cellulose that the animals eat into uh, stuff that you know, uh, supports their metabolism. And the end product of that breakdown process is a small molecule with one carbon and four hydrogens on it called methane. And unless somebody can invent a different kind of gut chemistry for ruminant animals, we can't get away from that one either. Unless, again, we say, let's put all the cows and sheep into a giant building and suck all the air through a filter and don't laugh. I mean, there is a research project at Durham University just kicking off to do something along those lines, direct air capture of um, ruminant animal emissions. But it's a complex problem to try and tackle. And you know, again, we might be able to reduce you know, through feed additives, changing feeding regimes, things like that. Um, you know, if we're allowed to do gene editing, which it looks like more likely now in the UK, some people don't like the idea, but perhaps advanced breeding techniques may take us uh, into territory where we can deliberately select the animals that have the least methane output per unit of production. So we can try and manage these things down, but we won't be able to get rid of them altogether. So 50% of our greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture is nitrous, I'm sorry, it's methane, about 35% is nitrous oxide, and about 10% is carbon dioxide. And the total is about 46.5 million tonnes CO2 equivalent per year, according to official statistics. So we've got to try and get rid of that, counterbalance it, bring it down. And the plan, is called three pillars. Pillar one is be as efficient as possible, drive productivity, new technologies, new breeding techniques, better management of your animal and plant health, all kinds of things like that. They're all very additive. Um, and there are some recommendations out there already from independent bodies like the Climate Change Committee. So we think we can bring that down, perhaps setting ourselves a very stretching goal by 25%. We can cut greenhouse gas emissions without compromising food production by about 25%. Yeah. To, to, to counterbalance the remainder, then we're going into how do we actually remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And if we look at so-called nature-based solutions, how we can manage um, trees and hedgerows and soils to capture more carbon in the natural environment, it's really hard to go beyond a certain level. And there are serious issues with the permanence of the carbon capture uh, and the soils that can build organic matter can also degrade. Trees that you grow can disappear in a forest fire or disease. Um, even you know, making your hedgerows bigger, which is certainly something we think all farmers should have the opportunity to do, uh, hedgerows can get diseased and, and die as well. So, nature-based solutions are tricky, 
they, we want to use them, but we've got to be realistic about their finite capacity to store carbon. So we think maybe another 25% from nature-based solutions. And that leaves a relatively large figure, about half of the total, which has got to be delivered through a combination of so-called engineered greenhouse gas removals. And so those are things then um, like, um, well, certainly more use of wood in construction. Wood and agricultural fibre, long-lived bio-based products, which end up in uh, you know, long-lived products. Some of them may be things like know, wind turbine blades or aircraft bodies or spaceships even perhaps made of biocomposites. Quite a bit of it can be conventional timber and engineered timber used in the construction industry. But these are still relatively small um, carbon sinks. The biggest user of energy or the biggest thing that pushes carbon around actually is the energy industry. And so if we can harness the energy industry to find uh, you know, and couple it to ways to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and perhaps just concentrate the CO2 and stick it somewhere like a geological reservoir, and this is being you know, very seriously investigated at the moment, we've got potentially two pathways. One, using bioenergy at various different scales. Big power stations, small power stations, which are capturing carbon dioxide that they might otherwise just release into the atmosphere. Whether it goes up a smokestack as dilute carbon dioxide, or whether it comes out of something like a biogas plant, an AD plant, as well as the concentrated carbon dioxide. We can capture that CO2. It either goes into a geological reservoir, or at the very least, it gets used to make something else. You can make polyols and polyurethane out of carbon dioxide as feedstock. Um, there are you know, clever new chemistries that we can integrate into our big national task of um, getting to net zero. And so the idea is a, a variety of engineered greenhouse gas removals, uh, many of them potentially accessible to agriculture as a supplier of the raw material feedstock, uh, are part of our plan. So we've got a plan, and actually it's a plan that stood the test of time for the last couple of years, and it's been emulated by lots of other industries. Most industries actually, even you know, talk to bankers and so on, they'll say, oh yes, you know, Goldman Sachs is going to uh, manage down its greenhouse gas emissions and have a transport plan and a, and, a, and a building management plan and this and that plan to bring down their emissions in the first place. And then we're going to, um, well, the residual emissions, we're going to offset them. Okay. So what are you going to do? Oh, we're going to find some farmers and do a deal with them all that will, um, you know, we'll, we'll pay for farmers to plant trees. And that will be our carbon offset. Well. Okay, we'll probably have a bit of that. It's nice to see private sector money coming into that sort of activity, but we do need to be very careful about how it's measured and um, that it doesn't end up being double counted because you know, the bankers want to say, well, that's our carbon offset. Well, then the farmers can't handle this our carbon offset as well. So, and we certainly need all of this to happen under the watchful eye of our civil servants and ministers in DEFRA. So the people who are doing the political decision making have also got to set up a framework that says, okay, this is how we're going to monitor and verify and report this, and this is how we're going to have a, a fair system in which the public and the media can have confidence because there won't be any double counting. So there's quite a lot of work to be done here. This is not a non-trivial problem. Can we do it? Yes, we do believe we can do it, but it you know, gives a bit more time, which sounds perhaps a bit too much like Boris, but maybe not. We are actually doing something here. We're, we're engaging in the action rather than just the words. Um, so, yeah, I'll, let me skip through a few more things here. And, and you, so there's, there are a number of things I was, you know, I really can't show this to you except in a picture, but um, in advance of what was meant to be the COP26 climate talks happening last year, we already had 26 case studies of farmers doing different kinds of actions. Farmers who were enhancing their hedgerows or managing their soils or um, operating anaerobic digester plants or solar farms or whatever it was. And you know, we wanted to be able to publicize this and say, look, here are real examples of farmers actually doing this kind of thing. We've got, if, you know, anyone's got a mobile phone on them, um, look at hashtag pledge2040. Hashtag pledge2040. 2040. That's not a furniture polish, for those of you who remember. Uh, no, it, it, is, it is about farmers making a pledge and, and populating a map to say, we're behind this plan. Now, one of the, when, when Minette Batters first came out with um, the declaration that we were going to be net zero by 2040, one of the fears that we had is, oh my god, this is going to go down really badly with the membership. 
actually, it didn't. It went down really well. This has been welcomed by lots of farmers who are really interested in the idea that here's something, a really big national and international goal that they could be making a contribution towards. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a way of attracting young people into farming. Um, you know, it, it's a mission that everybody can share. It's something that we, you know, we're not going to insist that every single farm has to get to net zero because that might be really difficult to audit or achieve. But it's a, a, it's a collective goal and we don't want any farmers to feel that they're being sort of totally left behind. So the idea is to communicate as much to our own membership as we are communicating externally or to government and saying, this is what we're doing. So having something like a pledge map and an opportunity for farmers to say, yes, I'm you know, committing to improving my hedgerows and doing some you know, uh, energy efficiency measures and some animal feeding change of regime and so on, and I'll put it on the map. And we can then take a copy of this pledge map and say, look, you know, there's 500 points on this map. These are farmers up and down the length of the country, Minister. They're all behind this plan. Please give us policy measures that are going to make it easier to deliver. So there's a lot of this, you know, communication stuff that needs to be done um, at the same time as just trying to figure out what actions we can take. Uh, so as I said, I, mean, I think we should break for questions fairly soon, but let me say a little bit more about renewable energy and you know, the progress that's been made. Anyone here want to have a guess how much of our electricity today, how much electricity in that light bulb is coming from renewables on average? 5%? 25%? 50%? 30. 30. Okay. Oh, yeah. Anyway, the, uh, <laughs> the actual figure today is about 40% or 42%. No, we're doing quite well in terms of decarbonising electricity production in this country. We stopped pretty much altogether using coal. Well, maybe until just recently because of uh, upheaval in the price of uh, gas and other things. But no, you know, many of the coal-fired power stations have been retired. A, lo a lot of renewable electricity generation capacity, both onshore and out at sea in the form of offshore wind farms, has been built, and there's a lot more to come. And as I was saying earlier, solar is certainly going to be supreme um, in, in the longer term. So, um, you know, we, we generate more electricity from the combined renewables now than we do from the fossil fuels. And you know, there's a certain amount of import-export that also takes place. So um, you know, progress is being made, and, and some people are not even aware that that much progress has been made. Worldwide, we've got some figures here, wind power and solar power capacity both exceeds 700 megawatts. Um, which is quite a lot. I, I, you know, I guess I need to try and put this totally in context, but if you compare this with the nuclear industry worldwide, the nuclear industry is somewhere around about 350 gigawatts. Sorry, did I say megawatts? <laughs> that's wrong, sorry, that was, that's, a, that's a typo, that's going to be gigawatts. Um, so, the, the uh, you know, both wind and solar worldwide have about double the installed capacity of the nuclear industry. The nuclear industry has been around since about 1956. Wind and solar have been around for considerably less than that. Wind since about the mid-1980s, solar realistically since about 2005, before it really started deploying a scale. Um, about a quarter of world electricity comes from renewables, um, which again you know, is twice the contribution of nuclear. Um, there's you know, strong, strong indications from bodies like the International Energy Agency that renewables will grow from a quarter to about a third of world electricity um, by the end of this coming decade, um, and, you know, and, and exceed coal generation, because clearly we've all got to get off coal, including the Chinese. Um, and solar is probably going to overtake oil as the world's number one traded energy commodity. So, you know, everybody's obsessed with the price of oil at the moment. Well, you know, they, they certainly have been in the past. Everybody's get terribly excited when the oil gets to $100 a barrel or something of the sort of disruption that's going to have around the world economy. Well, in the future, it'll be much less important what the price of oil is. It will be the cost point at which solar is being deployed, which will become really important. And solar electricity 
will probably, on a worldwide scale, end up being used for zillions of different applications. So, you know, we're on board with that because we've actually discovered that solar is also, you know, despite it not being a very sunny country, is cheap as chips here too. And bioenergy remains the fourth largest primary source of energy in the world. Lots of bioenergy used in the developing world, as in the form of traditional fuels, but increasingly also modernized bioenergy. All kinds of ways of um, using, especially growing crops or uh, forestry and agricultural residues as fuels, um, processing them into biogas, uh, lots of different conversion technologies, lots of different usable end products. And ultimately, and if we're going to get off fossil fuels altogether, then the carpet and the chairs that you're sitting on and, and all the paints and things like that that are used are all going to have to be made from alternatives to petroleum and coal tar type based products. All of that fossil fuel economy has got to be replaced by a carbohydrate economy based upon biological resources, some of which will come out of the agricultural sector. Um, Skipping it through, I mean, you know, one of, one of the points I certainly wanted to make was about sort of multifunctional farm landscapes. You know, we're not talking about a future agricultural world where, you know, all the land just has a single purpose. This bit is for food production, and this bit is a big solar farm, and over here is a wind turbines, and um, you know, and then over there is a, a nice nature reserve or something. So, no. You know, it is going to be multifunctional to some extent. There's a lot of argument about sharing and sparing and should some land be rewilded and given back to nature and so on. And you know, there isn't a simple answer to this. I think you know, sharing the land, which means often having you know, um, hedgerows that act as corridors for wildlife to be able to move through a farmed landscape, as opposed to sparing the land, which means nature reserve over here, intensive farming over there. There are different solutions for different parts of the country. And you know, it, it, it stands to reason that the solution that you might put into the Welsh mountains is certainly not going to be the same as the one that works in the middle of East Anglia or Northumberland. So, uh, you know, but, but multifunctionality, having a solar farm which is also biodiverse and managed for wildlife and or has sheep going in and grazing the grass in between the rows, that's kind of a clever use of land. Some people may say they still think they're as ugly as sin and they look like industrialising the countryside, but it's a way of making money from the land, which actually is what farms have been doing for thousands of years. Um, similarly, you know, you put up your wind turbines, you can carry on farming up and down in between them, as long as you don't you know, crash into them directly. They don't take up very much land space. It's a sort of swimming pool sized foundation at the bottom of concrete and the big thing sticking up, but you know, the, the distancing of them means you can farm up and down in between. And if you're growing things like perennial energy crops, um, miscanthus grass and uh, short rotation coppice willow, these are new things in the landscape. People are going, ooh, I don't like to look at that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's what you might do now. You know, I used to have a lovely view of it across the field here. Well, you know, it's different. And actually, it can also be very biodiverse. Um, and even an introduced exotic grass like miscanthus, which looks like tall, sort of temperate climate sugarcane, um, it has gaps in it and it has habitat for small mammals and all sorts of wildlife that didn't necessarily evolve to live in miscanthus fields, but they can find a way of doing it. And willow coppice, the idea that you have these little sort of synthetic woodlands that get cut down every three years for wood fibre, um, well, in the year they're cut down, they're a little bit like open wheat fields and skylarks enjoy them. And in the years intervening, uh, they're like a little sort of, um, you know, uh, dense willow woodland. And they have willow, captain, yeah, willow catkins in them, which are an early season source of pollen, very important for pollinating insects. Um, so there are multiple functions that can come from these things. And, uh, you know, People find them quite interesting as, you know, sort of dog walking or country rambling kind of new features in the landscape. So, uh, you know, multifunctionality is really where it's at. And, you know, I think in this country, you know, I'm partly responsible for it myself, talking to the solar industry about 
good management of solar farms. Let's not make our solar farms ugly with barbed wire fences around the outside and, and uh, you know, swiveling video cameras on poles for security and things like that. No. Uh, you know, try to blend them into the landscape, follow the shape of the existing fields, and you can actually have things which are generally multifunctional and uh, you know, almost pleasing to the eye. Certainly, a lot of these you know, solar farms viewed from a long distance across the landscape just look like a water body. They're sort of shimmering and blue. Um, and actually, uh, and I was up on, what's the, what's the name of it called? Not Butzer Hill. Um, just south of Western Super Mare, there's a hill anyway near the M5. And we stayed in a very nice bed and breakfast there. And I walked up to the top of the hill and looked out at the landscape. And it was like, oh, yes, you know, it's the sunset levels in one direction. This was all, you know, at one point it was all marshland and it was drained for agriculture about a thousand years ago. And uh, you look around it now and you can see, oh, look, there's a few old solar farms, but there are also lots and lots of other man made human objects in the landscape from the fun fairs along Burnham. On, on sea and uh, uh, you know um, industrial parks and service stations and garden centres and things like that. You know, we have modified the landscape, so we shouldn't be getting overly precious about new things that come along and bring in a further modification to the landscape. But but and this is where solar starts to get really well. Is it is it uh, ranging out of control? We have five megawatt size solar farms, which are about 12 hectares in size, 30 acres. And then quite a lot of them uh, developed early on under um, the, the, the feed-in tariff scheme. Now, you know, I don't know whether you can envisage what um, 12 hectares or 30 acres looks like in terms of size. But ones that are being built now without subsidy are about 10 times as big as that. They're about 50 megawatts. And, the solar, farm, the solar modules have got a little bit more efficient, they're a bit more concentrated, um, but they still need about two hectares of land per megawatt. So we're talking about 100 hectare big projects. And now we're starting to see one or two ultra mega sized projects in the, in the UK landscape. So just northeast of Cambridge, there's a really big one, 500 megawatts, um, spread over a number of different parcels of land joined together by cabling. Some people are feeling a little bit overwhelmed by this in terms of you know, the, the planning application process. Um, but you know, from an NFU point of view, it's like willing buyers, willing sellers. Our farmers are going through a transition in agricultural policy as we move away from European agricultural support and into UK domestic agricultural support. Uh, farmers want to be able to have diverse, uh, you know, diversification sources of income. So they're very willing to sign lease agreements with solar farm developers saying, well, you can have your sheep back to graze this land afterwards, um, and you know, we'll pay your ground rent for the next 30 or 40 years. It's a pretty good deal. So, um, you know, but I think it is going to be challenged. I mean, my job is to rewrite some of our policy um, documents on good practice in solar farm management, because we're now looking at things that are 100 times as large as the original solar farms that were being built just 10 years ago. There's another, there are two back-to-back -back on the middle of Anglesey, which total up to a 500 megawatts. There's one that's got planning consent in North Kent near Faversham, 350 megawatts. Um, and then there are two or three others which are about 150 megawatts in size. Um, one in Essex, one in Scunthorpe, one in South Derbyshire. Um, but, you know, it, it's a growing industry and it hasn't stopped there. The biggest solar project in the world at the moment, well, which is the biggest solar project? <laughs> the Indians have got some big projects measured in thousands of megawatts. The Chinese have got some projects of the scale of about 2,000 megawatts each. Um, there was going to be a really big one in Serbia of about 2,000 megawatts, but I'm not sure that's going ahead now. Uh, but what's got really exciting is um, the idea that you connect these things to what are called high voltage direct current undersea cables and you can send the power to somewhere a thousand miles away. So in Australia, um, if you imagine a map of Australia, you've got Darwin at the top, you've got Alice Springs in the middle, so between Alice Springs and Darwin, very, very sunny, by the way, uh, they're going to put 17,000 megawatts of solar on a plot of land and a bunch of batteries, 
and send the power to Darwin, partly to power the city of Darwin um, by high voltage direct current cable. But it won't stop there. The cable will then go into the sea and all the way along, wiggling in through Indonesia to Singapore. And will supply, I'm not sure how much percentage, but 10%, 15% of Singapore's electricity for a single project. They're called Sun Cable. Look them up on the web. It's a real project, it's happening. And by the way, it's not the only one. There's another one in Australia, um, in Pilbara, which is in the sort of north western coast of Australia, which is a combination of solar and wind farm, very large amounts, you know, something like 20,000 20, megawatts of wind, 20,000 megawatts of solar. That one is meant to be sending power, again, with a, a, a monster double trip cable going to Indonesia. And a little closer to home, um, in the Financial Times just in the last week, there was a company called Xlinx being talked about. They're launching a project to build about 10,000 megawatts of solar in southern Morocco and have a cable that snakes its way all the way around the Iberian Peninsula. It doesn't go through the European electricity network. It's their own personal cable with permissions to put it along the edge of the continental shelf. It will come into the UK in Devon. <coughs> And uh, you know, that theoretically could supply as much electricity as Hinkley Point C nuclear power station or Drax power station currently does. So about 5%, 6% of UK electricity needs. And they believe they could build it within 10 years. It's not rocket science. The solar technology exists and it's getting cheap as chips. The battery technology exists, it's getting cheap. And the cable technology exists. And we've already got several big interconnectors Connecting our electricity system, there's one that runs to Lincolnshire to Denmark, there's one uh, called Nordlink from um, the coast of Northumberland across to Norway. Uh, so some of these things are already uh, you know, getting to sort of six or seven hundred kilometres in length. So it's not, you know, it's only a matter of time before we finally build the one that's been talked about for years from the north of Scotland to Iceland. Lots of renewable energy resources in Iceland. And then the idea that we're going to be getting some of our electricity from solar in Morocco, it's kind of mind-boggling, but if the people say they can build it in 10 years, well, why are we putting any money into some of these other things that are much more expensive and much more difficult and dangerous to deal with in the long term? It's really interesting. So, you know, we want to be part of this. I don't think we want, you know, we don't entirely welcome the absolutely monstrous solar farms here. They're going to be a little bit difficult to manage, but there is clearly a big, big opportunity, as I was saying, and I think in the future, solar electricity is probably going to be the world's number one energy source. Uh, said a little bit about energy storage. I mean, you know, what do you want to know about energy storage? There's lots of it being built in the UK. There's a very long pipeline now of projects in development. Uh, I had a lovely slide here. If I find it. The pipeline is 16 and a half gigawatts. And it won't all necessarily get built, some of those projects won't get planning consent or won't get financed or something. But something of the order of half of that is certainly going to get built. We're going to have 8,000, 10,000 megawatts of battery electricity storage in this country before very long. And, and you know, it's not just happening in this country, it's happening all over the world. But it's a very good complement to the intermittency of renewable electricity generation. Now clearly, you know, I've got five megawatts, uh, five kilowatts of solar on my roof at home um, and it does the job but it produces mostly in the summer months and less in the winter months but what it does do generally is produce the same shape electricity production every day it is very predictable wind power on the other hand is a little more I don't know what you call it stochastic variation or something of the sort you know it you can roughly predict how much wind power is going to be available. You can certainly predict it 48 hours ahead as the weather systems come through, but it's not there constantly. So you do need things like energy storage technologies to complement the variable and intermittent renewables. But you know, these sources of electricity are getting extremely cheap. Therefore, you know, it does make sense to have a natural strategy that says, in the future, many of our vehicles are going to be running on electricity and charged off electricity as long as we can manage the flows of electricity at different times of the day. And we can probably also think quite a lot about how we may be able to heat our homes with electricity. It's not the only solution, but new ways of heating homes in the future is a very important part of the national governmental net zero strategy. And you know, there's, a, there's a role for agriculture there also in supplying uh, methane gas through anaerobic digestion to replace the fossil gas in the gas network. 
I think I probably <coughs> shut up at that point because but there were, well, maybe one one couple of last points. Um, you know, you, we hear a lot about the hydrogen economy, the idea that surplus electricity can just be turned into hydrogen using electrolysis. But you know, quite a number of people do have doubts about the applications of this. I think it's going to be very important for the hydrogen economy to prove itself in um, high safety situations like the steel industry or the cement industry um, as, a, as a source of industrial process heat to begin with um, before you let it loose on the general public. The idea that everybody's going to have hydrogen powered domestic heating boilers I do find slightly frightening. Um, and I don't think that hydrogen powered vehicles are going to necessarily take off in a big way because you know, we've already got VHS, what do we need beta max? You know? One thing is, you know, there will be technological lock-in, just as there are with all sorts of other um, market developments and product cycles. Um, but, but you know, the idea that we will have surplus hydrogen available from things like, you know, Boris Johnson's Saudi Arabia of offshore wind power. Um, yes, but some of those, you know, some of those wind turbines, I think, will be making hydrogen with electrolyzers on board, and then perhaps the hydrogen will be immediately turned into something much more useful, like ammonia. Ammonia is rather, it's a dreadful smelly stuff, but it's a very useful molecule because it's got a relatively, uh, whatever it is, you know, it's liquid at not very cold temperatures. So you can liquefy ammonia and transport it around the world a hell of a lot more easily and safely than you can move hydrogen around the world in liquid form. Um, and ammonia may also be potentially a future shipping fuel um, used in, you know, essentially diesel type engines that are combusting ammonia. So. All sorts of interesting possibilities there. So a whole new economy may be coming soon based around making small, useful synthetic molecules. This may actually be the way that we keep aviation going in the future as well. Short-haul aviation may be able to go electric. Long-haul aviation will probably require synthetic fuels. And those fuels may actually be made by taking renewable hydrogen and then putting it through a series of chemical synthesis processes using perhaps previously captured carbon dioxide from biological sources so that we don't add any more carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere when the synthetic fuel burns in the jet engines. Um, there's all sorts of possibilities in the world. I'm not sure somebody said that on television. Um, so there we are. Um, I think that's probably enough from me.